What's up E3 members, excited to be standing here with Hill Goodspeed, the historian at the National Naval Aviation Museum. And behind us we have the B-25. And if you're in the Air Force, you kind of start out with the Doolittle Raiders as kind of a cornerstone of one of the missions that was really important, that had a lot of planning that went into, and it was a strike on Japan after the Pearl Harbor attack. You start out with it, and today we're gonna to talk about how like naval aviation had a tie to it, as well as a little bit about B-25 and some of the things that were going on in the era. So Hill, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thanks for having me again. Uh, yes, the B-25, it really draws some attention when people walk in here, because first of all, they don't expect to see an Army Air Force's plane in here, but then they get the appreciation or for what it represents, which is definitely one of the more uh, audacious uh, operations that have ever, has ever been carried out in the U.S. military. Uh, to, as a refresher, April 1942, uh, the U.S. Navy really doesn't have the capability to fight J Japan in sea battles. Uh, those come a few months later. So they do a lot of uh, carrier hit and run raids. And this one, though, was something that, that took that to a whole new level. Um, it was envisioned uh, early, really shortly after Pearl Harbor they started to envision a way how can we strike back at Japan um, and it, as much for morale as for any material damage that the strike would cause and they come up with this uh, joint operation uh, which was uh, you know joint operations now are more commonplace back then they were not really commonplace so they had this joint operation they pick Jimmy Doolittle one of the most acclaimed aviators in the world at that time not, not just the United States but the world to hey, can you uh, see if we can take the, this type of bomber, the B-25, the only one capable of really launching from a carrier, right. and uh, see if we can launch a strike against Japan. Well, you know, Jimmy Doolittle was, was acclaimed. He had a doctorate from MIT. He had a lot of patents to his credit. He, he was an air racing pilot, developed some tech, uh, procedures for blind flying. And so he knew most everything you could know about aviation, but he did not know how to take off in a short distance. So the Navy had to assign somebody to assist and train the Doolittle Raiders before they even got to Hornet. And so they chose a young flight instructor here at NAS Pensacola uh, named Lieutenant Henry Miller. And he literally got orders to go down to what is now uh, one of the outlying fields at Eglin Air Force Base and said, you'll know what you're gonna do when you get there. So with his fresh $6 or per diem that he got back then, off he went. <laughs> and he next finds himself standing face to face with Jimmy Doolittle with a skill that Doolittle does not have or nor any of the Army Air Force's pilots have, which is how to take off in that short distance. So he spends weeks there training them on how, on how to take this twin engine bomber not designed to take off on the distance of a carrier deck and teaching them how to set the throttles and, and do all the techniques required to get the maximum amount of lift to get off the short runway. And so he was very key in, in making that raid possible and he went aboard Hornet with them and pretty much was on board the ship all the way to the point where they launched. And so he was, uh, uh, later Admiral Miller, uh, he was an honorary Doolittle Raider. He was uh, with them all, through all their famous reunions afterward and was uh, just a key component of, of that mission. But it's just a, it's a lesson in one, Jimmy Doolittle having the humility to know that there's something I don't know that I need to be successful in accepting this instruction from somebody much junior to him. And for Lieutenant Miller, it's an individual who has to have the confidence to tell one of the most acclaimed aviators in the country, hey, you don't know how to do this and you're not doing it right and here's how you have to do this to make it successful. Seeing some of the great sheets you brought out, to me, that's really, it's really cool to see. It's, it's humbling, obviously, to, to see it and see what the great, the comments were and realize that, like you just said, the mo one of the most acclaimed aviators in the world at that time is taking instruction from a very junior person, but it has that right. skill set. And I think that's a key part of aviation to begin with. It doesn't matter how old you are, how experienced you are, there's always something you can learn. Right. And you can probably learn from someone who might be le have been around the flagpole just a few less times than you have. So having that open mind. Can you talk about what was some of the things they had to do in order to get ready to go out there? Well, they, um, one was just to learn the techniques and to have faith in, okay, I. I don't, I've never taken off in this short distance, but I, I know the settings and able to do it. And this, plus they had to modify the aircraft. They had to uh, make them as light as possible. So they did everything in their power to save weight. And one of the more uh, notable things they did, and one of the more uh, famous things they did was to um, remove all the defensive armament. Uh, so they figured if we can just take off, we don't need the defensive machine guns, but they wanted to leave the impression that they were still on the airplane. 
So they famously took broomsticks and painted them black <laughs> and put them in the tail section so an attacking enemy fighter would, at least on the first pass or so, think that they, had, uh, they were going to be dealing with a machine gun. Another uh, unique thing about it was they, developed, they didn't really need a Norden bomb site because they weren't going to be f uh, bombing at a high altitude. So they, they took, developed this, uh, one of the squadron members developed this little bomb site, just a few pieces of metal welded together that they could simply line up uh, the target. And uh, we've rec recreated that uh, bomb site here in our aircraft on display along with the broomstick uh, in the tail section. So little things like that uh, that they, they modify, but but primarily you're looking at individuals who um, they knew it was a, a, a mission that they didn't, some of them, most all of them knew that the chances of them even coming back were going to be slim, but uh, they were all volunteers and, and they knew what needed to be done in those early months of World War II, that they, they needed to, to hit back and they believed in the mission, believed in the nation. And so that was the best ingredient among them, uh, uh, not just the machines, but just the, the individuals inside of them and what they did. You talk about just thinking about how of a dire situation that would be or what a challenge that would be, taking off your guns, lighting up everything possible. And you might think, well, 50 pounds here, 20 pounds there, that should be that much. But again, you think about the, the long range strike that this was, especially in that day and age, right. it's really impressive to think that people volunteered to go out there and do it. Can you talk to me a little bit about the, the mission and kind of repaint that for everybody? Right, uh, the mission was that they loaded the, uh, the aircraft uh, on board the Hornet, uh, headed out to sea. And uh, what's another interesting thing, there was a, actually an airship, a uh, blimp that went out to deliver supplies they needed. And okay. we actually had the control car of that actual blimp that did this. So there's another connection to Little Raid. But they joined up with USS Enterprise and formed a task force. And Enterprise was along because Hornet, in order to get all these B-25s on board, they had none of their own aircraft anymore. They couldn't uh, protect themselves uh, with a combat air patrol. So Enterprise along the way was the was the ship that had the protective fighters and then the like but the uh, rough weather going toward japan it was going to be rough even in the most ideal circumstances but one thing that really impacted the mission was the task force was spotted uh, in advance of where they were supposed to launch and so for fear that the uh, uh, the vessel the japanese vessels that spotted them would relay and radio message to the, the defenses uh, on the home islands they decided to launch ahead of schedule and what that did is it put the b-25s at, at much longer range from where the airfields they were supposed to land in China, the distance between the two. So they didn't make it to the airfields where they were supposed to land. So they either crash landed along the shore um, or inland. And But miraculously, despite that fact, most of the Doolittle Raiders uh, made their way uh, back to friendly lines. There were some crew members who were captured and uh, ultimately some of them were executed uh, in the hands of the Japanese. But uh, it was a, uh, miraculously, they all the majority of them made it home. And uh, Jimmy Doolittle thought he was going to be court-martialed and instead he received the Medal of Honor. Uh, and, and the Doolittle Raiders had a unique uh, connection that they maintained uh, for the rest of their lives. Uh, they had annual reunions. There was the famous goblets that they all had that they took and the last Doolittle Raiders would toast each other um, with uh, some liquor that was, I think, bottled in uh, uh, Jimmy Doolittle's birth year. Um, and then they eventually got to that point where they decided with the remaining Raiders to go ahead and make that final toast. But it was, uh, they were very, uh, a very tight knit group, as you can imagine. And um, as far as a representative of a mission, uh, it didn't really inflict a lot of material damage on the Japanese, but the morale right. was just a uh, boost to the United States was tremendous. And it just exemplified the, the heroism of that generation in, in that great uh, struggle, which was World War II. How did they get this onto the aircraft carrier? Hoisted aboard by crane. So they didn't, they never landed. Uh, so no, no, none of the Doolittle Raiders became tail hookers. They actually just uh, trained them aboard at uh, Naval Air Station Alameda. With, uh, with that 16 aircraft, did they have only 16 on, on the ship? I believe they only had the 16 on board. That's, a, that's all they could really pack on board. Okay. Um, and uh, to, be, uh, to be the lead aircraft with the least amount of deck, and, and Jimmy Doolittle was that he led from the front, and, and he was the lead aircraft that launched, as you would expect, and, uh, and to show how it could, how it could be done. And, and on board, the captain of Hornet was actually Mark Mitcher who later went on to become the famous uh, commander of Task Force 58, the carriers that led the strikes. 
across the Pacific. And ironically, you know, he led the task force that later on launched the first carrier raids against Japan by carrier aircraft. And those are the first carrier launched aircraft since the Doolittle raid that actually hit Japan. So it was, it, events came full circle. That's incredible. Can you talk to me specifically about this B-25 and you know, getting into the museum. This is a big plane, and as you mentioned, Army Air Corps plane sitting here. What was some of the, what's some behind the scenes of getting this plane in here? Sure, we um, had this dis uh, aircraft for many years, and it was on display on our flight line outside. And initially, we painted it as a PBJ, which was a Marine Corps version of the B-25. So we had the Navy paint scheme on it. And then we're, we're starting to approach the 75th anniversary of the Doolittle Raid, and, and the decision was made, let's, let's honor that and paint this aircraft like a Doolittle Raider, and let's display it indoors. And, and you know, unlike a lot of Navy aircraft we have in here, which are relatively small in size, and have folding wings, which right. make them more conducive to moving around, this one does not. So we uh, have some uh, active duty military volunteers here, so we took some of our ensigns with engineering degrees, and they uh, figured out actually where it would fit best and how it would maneuver through the beams. And our restoration crew are, uh, got it all painted, all fixed up, and they actually practiced on the flight line how they were going to move things because we actually had to move 17 aircraft in some way, shape, or form and actually uh, suspend nine or pull nine down. So it was a very intricate operation to get that in here. Uh, but it was, uh, it, it was something that was, uh, that was real important to us to have this feature prominently at the intro to the World War II section. And, and what's made it really special too is all Air Force combat systems officers are trained here. And a number of the bombardment squadrons, I, even, I think even all of the bombardment squadrons from which the Doolittle Raiders were drawn are still in existence. And some of the members of the Air Force squadrons who do the CISO training here were assigned to their, those squadrons during uh, one of their tours. And right when we unveiled this, and it was on display outside before we moved it in, they asked if they could come over and do a ceremony of remembrance of the Doolittle Raiders. And that was a real, a special thing to, we, we told ourselves, you know, we've done something good here um, to connect the active duty force uh, to their history. And, and it's just a real, uh, it's a real nice aircraft to have in here. And it tells just a great story of Naval Aviation and uh, Army Air Forces and joint warfare in general. Hill, I really appreciate it. It's great to be able to learn a little bit more about this. It's incredible to see it sitting here in the museum. And again, I appreciate you taking the time to share a little bit more. Happy to do it. Thanks awesome. a lot, John. E3 members, hope you enjoyed this. Again, we got more coming your way, so stay tuned.